This third talk I've entitled uh, Shameless Sexuality, Male and Female. And I'm going to read from uh, Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28, and then chapter 2, 23 to 25. And again, as we come to God's Word, let's pray. Father, what we know not, please teach us. Uh, what we are not, uh, please make us. And what we have not, please give us for the sake of your Son, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever praised. Amen. So let's hear God's Word from Genesis chapter 1, uh, 26 to 28. <clears throat> then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed." I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that in the last few years, we have seen a seismic shift in Western culture in relation to the issues of gender and sexuality. What was once a clear distinction between male and female genders, recognized by every civilization since the beginning of time, is now blurred, confused, and distorted. This is seen from Facebook offering limitless options to describe your gender in your profile, to families raising their children gender neutral, to countries like Sweden creating a new word to refer to a third category of people in society who are neither male nor female, to Bruce Jenner, stepfather of the Kardashians, having hormone replacement therapy and operations to make him, make him look like a woman, in 2015, he appeared on the front cover of Vanity Fair as Caitlyn Jenner. And then, more recently, just think of the 2020 Olympics, where we had a Canadian man competing in the women's weightlifting event because he had transitioned to being a woman. You just need to switch on the TV or go on the internet, and you can see that we live in a world of gender and sexuality confusion. <clears throat> we live in a world of gender confusion, and this is also true with the sexuality confusion. This confusion can be seen in something like the pride marches in major cities of the world, or the Mardi Gras festivals in various cities, where the LGBTQ community flaunt their homosexuality and transsexuality and bisexuality for all the world to see. In recent years, the confusion has been expressed in the legalization of same-sex marriage in various countries and here in the States by the Supreme Court. So we are in a fog of confusion, not only in relation to gender, but also in relation to sexuality. And the question is, how are we to respond as Christians? What are we to do about it? Well, one approach is what I call the ghetto or ostrich approach. This is where the church retreats into its ghetto or buries its head in the sand like an ostrich and pretends that none of this is happening. 
I mean, of course, sure, we know this confusion is happening, but it's happening out there, not in here. And so we don't really want to talk about it in church. The only problem with this approach is that the Bible does talk about it, and God has given us laws about not perverting or changing our gender or sexuality precisely because he knows that the problem was never going to remain just out there, but was always going to be something that the people of God had to deal with in here. As the people of God, we are not immune to distortions of our gender and sexuality. So that's the first approach, the ghetto or ostrich approach. The other approach is what I call the the go-with-the-flow approach. This is where the church decides that actually the Bible is out of touch with the times, and so we need to move beyond the Bible and get with the times. For example, several years ago, the Church of Scotland decided to allow the ordination of practicing homosexuals. Interestingly, in their report, they admitted that the Bible was against such living, but they said it was time to move beyond the Bible. Other churches and denominations are not so honest. They argue that for 2,000 years we've wrongly interpreted the Bible on the issues of homosexuality. The problem with this go-with-the-flow approach is that God has always called His people to win the world by being different from the world. A better approach, as opposed to the ghetto ostrich approach or the -the go-with-the-flow approach, a better approach is what I call the lighthouse approach. The church's response to the gender and sexuality confusion is to be like a lighthouse, fixed on the rock of God's Word and providing light and guidance to those in the darkness and the fog of confusion. We're not to go with the flow, we're to stand But we are to stand, not in a ghetto, not with our head in the sand. We're to stand in the public square, shining the light of the truth of God's Word into the darkness. Jesus said that His church was to be a city set on a hill, shining as a bright light. The church is to speak publicly, not privately, to this issue. And in Genesis 1 and 2, God gives us His public perspective on the issue of gender and sexuality. And my prayer is that the Spirit of God would shine the light of God's Word into the darkness and blow away the fog. Because Genesis 1 and 2 gives us four clear perspectives to consider in the fog of confusion over gender and sexuality. But first, um, a qualification. In this lecture, I'm going to refer to different kinds of sexualities. Heterosexuality, male and female sexual relations or attraction. Homosexuality, male and male or female and female sexual relations or attraction. Bisexuality, sexual relations or attraction between a person and both a male and female person. Transsexuality, where a person changes their gender or sex from one gender or sex to another. Zoosexuality, historically known as bestiality, where a person is attracted to animals or has sexual relations with animals. Now, I'm aware that some terminology like this might be uncomfortable for some, and I want to acknowledge that. I also want to say that there is a generation of young contemporary pastors who lack propriety and decorum when it comes to speaking about such issues. The Bible never speaks loosely or provocatively about such issues. It never flaunts sexuality. But equally so, the Bible does speak about such issues. All the different sexualities that I've just mentioned are covered in the Bible. If you read Leviticus chapter 18 and 20. So while we must avoid loose or provocative talk about these realities, equally so, we must avoid a Victorian prudishness that seeks to be more holy than the Bible in what we can and cannot talk about in church. 
So that's the first qualification. The Bible speaks openly about sexuality, but with propriety, and so should we. Now, with that qualification made, let us now look at these four perspectives from God's Word on the issues of gender and sexuality. Number one, before there was gender and sexuality, there was God. Before there was gender and sexuality, there was God. We see this from the very simple fact that Genesis 1-1 precedes Genesis 1-27. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Before there was gender and sexuality, there was God. The point may be obvious, but it's foundational to this whole discussion because the whole discussion regarding gender and sexuality is at root a question of authority. Who has the authority to decide someone's gender or sex or sexuality? A few years ago, Facebook changed it. Facebook changed its gender policy from 58 genders to allowing any description of gender. Why? Because people started to ask Facebook, who gave you the authority to conclude that there are only 58 gender possibilities? Who elected you the gender officials of the Western world? Who gave you the authority? And so Facebook passed the authority to the individual. Each person now has the authority to decide for themselves what gender they would like to be on Facebook. The same could be said over the issue of sexuality. At root, it's a question of authority. Who has the authority to decide someone's sexuality? We're told, not parents, not government, and certainly not the church. Each person has the authority to decide for themselves what sexual orientation they have. And this is where Genesis 1-1 comes into the discussion, because before there was gender and sexuality, there was God. This is the first foundational perspective that we as Christians must affirm in this debate over gender and sexuality. Before there was gender and sexuality, there was God. In the beginning, God. God was there before the beginning because He has always been there. God is and was and is to come. He is eternal. He pre-existed before all things because He never not existed. And as the eternal pre-existing God who stands before all things, who created the reality of all things, He is the one who gets to define all things. We see this in the creation week. God creates reality, and then He defines reality. He makes reality, and then He names reality. Day one, God creates light and darkness and distinguishes between them both, then calls the light day, and the darkness He calls night. Day three, God separates water and land, and then He calls the waters seas, and the dry ground He calls land. Nothing in this world exists without God, and nothing in this world receives its definition or name outside of God. And it's the same when it comes to gender and sexuality. God created man in two genders, and then He called the one gender male and the other female. Let us make man in our own image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created gender and sexuality. And then he defined gender and sexuality. And he defines them because he was before them. This is why Genesis 1-1 is the most offensive verse in the whole Bible. Because the verse says to us, God, not man, is the ultimate authority on any issue. 
because he was before all things. He created all things, and therefore he gets to name and define all things, including gender and sexuality. Before there was gender and sexuality, there was God. Which means that any attempt on our part to recreate what God has already created or to rename what God has already named or to redefine what God has already defined is called rebellion, not freedom. It's called trying to be God when we're not God. The Western world's take on gender and sexuality in recent years can be reduced to just four words. Did God really say? Did God really say? These are the four words that the devil spoke in the beginning. And they encapsulate the whole fog of confusion. Did God really say? That has been the devil's plan from the beginning, to question the authority of what God says. He loves to attack God's authority. He also loves to attack God's glory in what he has made. Have you ever thought about why the LGBTQ community have targeted their attacks on marriage on the businesses related to cakes, photography, and flowers? Ever thought of why these are the businesses that are under attack? Well, very simple. Cakes, photography, and flowers capture the glory of a wedding. They celebrate the beauty of one man and one woman in holy matrimony, and so they attack it because, they do, because it doesn't match with what they want marriage to be. They rob others of the glory of marriage because they don't have any glory in their marriages. But at root, the whole discussion regarding gender and sexuality is a question of authority. It's a question of glory, and the devil attacks that, but at root, he attacks God's authority. It's a question of who gets to be God. Our society wants to say that the authority to name and define gender And sexuality resides in personal choice, cultural convention, a social construct, a majority vote, a referendum, a government think tank, a Supreme Court ruling. But the Bible says no. The authority to name and define gender and sexuality resides in God alone, the God who was and is and is to come. Before there was gender and sexuality, there was God, which means God, not you or me, but God gets to define what is and therefore what ought to be. So that is our first point. Before there was gender and sexuality, there was God, which brings us to the second perspective on gender and sexuality in Genesis 1 and 2. Heterosexuality is God's good idea. Heterosexuality is God's good idea. Chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Here is God having a discussion with himself, because God is one and God is three persons, and God decides here in discussion with himself to make mankind in two parts, male and female, opposite but complementary. This creation of man as male and female continues the creation of complementary couplets earlier in Genesis. God has already made light and darkness, day and night, sea and land, sun and moon, fish and birds. And now he makes man and woman, male and female. But different to these other couplets that God makes, God pauses to discuss with himself the creation of man. This shows reflection and contemplation. It shows that the creation of man as male and female is God's idea. 
It's not the accident of evolution or the convention of culture. It's God's creation. This is made even more plain in chapter 2, verse 18 and following, where God makes the woman. Notice how in verse 18, the idea for the man to have a helper is God's idea. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make for him a helper fit for him. Notice also that it's God who puts Adam into a deep sleep in verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And then he creates a woman from his side. It's God's decision to make this creature from Adam's side a she and not a he. And notice that it's God who then brings the woman to the man, verse 22, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And when the man sees her, he acknowledges that she's equal but different, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And precisely because they are equal but different, they come together as one flesh. God brings the man and woman together like two magnets. In order for two magnets to come together, they both need to be magnets, and they both need to have the quality of a magnet, but one has to give off a positive field and the other a negative field if they're going to come together. Two positives repel each other. Two negatives repel each other, but a positive and a negative come together. And it's the same with male and female. God makes the man and the woman equal but different in order that they might come together and become one flesh. They fit naturally together. Do you see how sexual attraction between male and female, between a man and a woman is God's idea. He initiated the whole thing. He's the main actor in chapter 2, 18 to 25. But it's more than his idea. It's God's good idea. Chapter 1, verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Here is God's assessment of the couplets and this couple at the end of his creation week. Very good. Male and female coming together in one flesh, in God's eyes, is brilliant. It's class. It's amazing. It's just what it was meant to be. It's very good. It's why God announces his benediction over it. In chapter 1, verse 28, and God blessed them. Heterosexuality is God's very good idea, which means that any other kind of sexuality is man's bad idea, over which there can be no benediction, no word of blessing. Homosexuality, bisexuality, transsexuality, zoo sexuality are all bad ideas. And they are bad ideas because they distort God's good idea. They pervert God's good order. Now, this is a really key point in the discussion over sexuality. There is only one good idea when it comes to sexuality, and that is heterosexuality. There is only one good natural created reality when it comes to sexuality, heterosexuality. All other sexualities are bad ideas. All other sexualities are unnatural sexualities. They are distortions, corruptions, perversions of the one good natural sexuality, which is heterosexuality. Perhaps I can give an illustration here with relation to my son. When my son Ben was younger, uh, he and I would play Play-Doh together. And sometimes I would bring a ball of Play-Doh onto the table and make a person from it. And then I would hand that little Play-Doh man 
to ban. Now, he had two options, two choices. He could either respect Play-Doh man I'd given him and play with him as he was, or he could change him. Well, I'll leave it up to your imagination which one it was. That's often what he would do. He'd change it. He'd pull off a leg here, lengthen an arm, press his finger into Play-Doh man's forehead. Do you know what Ben didn't do? He didn't bring his own Play-Doh ball onto the table and create a new Play-Doh man besides the Play-Doh man I had given him. No, there was only one ball of Play-Doh on the table. Ben had only one Play-Doh man to play with, the one I'd given him, and he distorted it. He ruined it. He corrupted it. And it's the same when it comes to sexuality. There is only one created sexuality on the table, heterosexuality, between a man and a woman. We can either accept it, respect it, and embrace it, or we can distort it, corrupt it, and pervert it. This is very different to the story of sexuality that the world gives us. The world wants us to say that there are many different balls of sexuality on the table, all equal, all moldable into whatever sexuality you would like, heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, transsexuality, zoo sexuality. The world wants to say that these sexualities are just varieties within the natural order. They are just variants within a species, as the theory of evolution teaches. But the Bible teaches that sin is a perversion of what is, not a variant within what is. Sin is a perversion of what is, not a variant within what is. Let me tease that out a wee bit. Whereas a heterosexual person loves a different self, a homosexual person loves the same self by duplicating the self. Whereas a heterosexual person is content to love one other, different self, a bisexual person loves two other selves, a different self and a duplicated self. Whereas a heterosexual person is content with him or herself, a transsexual person is discontent with him or herself and so tries to change themselves. Whereas a heterosexual person loves an equal self, the zoosexual person loves an unequal self and so defiles the self. In every case, these sexualities make unnatural what God made natural. In every case, they distort, corrupt, pervert God's good natural order because there is only one ball of sexuality on the table. And as God's creatures, we either accept it, respect it, and embrace it, or we distort it, corrupt it, pervert it. So to summarize this second point, heterosexuality is God's good idea, and every other kind of sexuality is man's bad idea. So we've seen two things so far. Before there was gender and sexuality, there was God. And second, heterosexuality is God's good idea. Number three, marriage is for heterosexuality. Marriage is for heterosexuality. Now notice what I just said there. I didn't say heterosexuality is for marriage, which is true. The appropriate expression of sexual relations is in marriage. In that sense, heterosexuality is for marriage. But what Genesis 2.24 teaches us is that marriage is for heterosexuality. Look at verse 23 and 24 of chapter 2. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman 
because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Precisely because Adam is presented with Eve, precisely because he has met his complementary other in nature, a marriage takes place. What I mean is that God first made nature, and then he made a law to fit around nature, as Richard Baxter, the Reformed pastor, put it succinctly. God made men, and then he gave them laws. God made men, and then he gave them laws. First nature, then law. And we see this throughout Genesis 1 and 2. God first creates, and then he commands what he has created. First nature, then law. This is best illustrated in relation to the Sabbath. In Genesis 1, God first makes man on day 6, and then in chapter 2, 1 to 3, he sanctifies the Sabbath day, the, the seventh day as a Sabbath. The Sabbath is made because of the nature of man is such that he will need a rest. In other words, the law of the Sabbath conforms to the nature of the man. Man is not made to conform to the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is not some arbitrary code pre-existing before man to which man was made to conform. No, rather, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, as Jesus said. In other words, God's law conforms to nature. Nature does not conform to God's law. And it's the same with marriage. God first creates man, then he creates woman, and then he brings them together in marriage. Note the order. First nature, male and female, and then a law called marriage for male and female. Marriage is only spoken of after God had made mankind male and female. In other words, marriage was made for man, not man for marriage. This is a really key point to grasp because I think we tend to think of God's laws as abstract, arbitrary, restrictive codes that just pre-exist and are just out there and that we were made to conform to them. But that is not how God's law is presented in the Bible. God's laws are good, holy, wholesome. And they are good, holy, and wholesome because they are molded to fit our created natures, which means that when God made laws, He did so for our own personal and social well-being. God's law conforms to who we are as His created creatures. If I may go back to my son Ben for a moment. As a father, I have certain rules for Ben in my home. And if I'm a good father, my rules will take into account who he is. A boy, not a girl. What age he is. How much he can understand. What is good for him. What is dangerous for him. And if I love him, I set the rules according to his nature. Because I am a father who loves him. And that's what God does with marriage. He conforms marriage to our natures because our natures are male and female, heterosexual in orientation. Marriage takes place because man meets woman, male meets female, and together they become one flesh. Heterosexuals fit together by nature, and marriage conforms to that natural fitness. Marriage is for heterosexuality. Yes, heterosexuality is for marriage. That's its only appropriate expression. But marriage is also for heterosexuality, which means that marriage is not for any other kind of sexuality because it cannot conform to different kinds of sexualities. The reason marriage can't conform to a homosexual union, for example, is because there can be no one flesh union. Homosexuals cannot consummate in one flesh union because they don't naturally fit together. It's why they can't actually marry. 
Two men don't fit together. Two women don't fit together. Marriage can't conform to bisexual union because there are three parties involved, not two. Marriage can't conform to zoo sexuality because there are not two equal parties. That's why you can't marry your dog. The only thing that marriage can conform to is heterosexuality, where two equal but different parties can naturally come together as one flesh. Now, I realize that we live in a world that says marriage does conform to homosexual relations, for example, just as the Supreme Court decided in 2015. But I'm reminded of the story of Abraham Lincoln in a public debate. While he was publicly debating an opponent, he turned to a man in the audience and he said to him, Sir, if I call a sheep's tail a leg, how many legs does the sheep have? And the man replied, five. And Abraham Lincoln replied, no, four. Just because we call the tail a leg doesn't mean it is a leg. And that's the same with same-sex marriage. Just because people and governments call a same-sex couple making vows to each other a marriage does not make it a marriage. It's actually a mirage, not a marriage. We're back to our first point. Before there was gender and sexuality, there was God. And what God says marriage is, is what marriage is, not what man says marriage is. Homosexual marriage is a figment of people's imagination. Even if the media put it on TV and promote it, still a figment of people's imagination. Even if a government puts it into law and gives people certificates, it is still a figment of their imagination. This is the reason we are opposed to same-sex marriage, because it does not compute with reality, with the created order. Another reason we're opposed to same-sex marriage is because it cannot conform to the picture of Christ and the church. Christ did not die for another Christ. The church does not submit to another church. Christ died for His bride, the church, and the church submits to her husband. So that's our third point. Marriage is for heterosexuality. Number four, heterosexuality in marriage is shameless. Heterosexuality in marriage is shameless. When God's good idea is kept, when His good order is followed, look at what happens. Chapter 2, verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. It was a shameless marriage. We human beings are at our most vulnerable when we are naked, but here are Adam and Eve before the fall, naked with each other, enjoying each other, and feeling no shame for it. Why? Because heterosexuality in marriage is shameless. There is no guilt. There's nothing to hide, everything to give, because in heterosexual relations in marriage, a person has met their perfect match. So what's there to hide? And precisely because heterosexuality in marriage is shameless, any sexuality outside of marriage, including heterosexuality, any sexuality outside of marriage is shameful. You only need to scratch a little bit below the surface, and you'll see that when sexuality is expressed outside of marriage in any way, shape, or form, there is deep, deep shame. Russell, Russell Brand, the British comedian, once commented on his viewing of pornography. He said it was like icebergs of filth floating through every house on Wi-Fi. Notice his language. He called it filth. He confessed that after watching porn, he never felt good 
in himself. Why not? Because he felt dirty. He felt shameful. He felt guilty. Women working in the adult industry say that after a day's work, they just want to go home, have a shower, get into bed, and curl up in the fetal position and go to sleep. What are they feeling? Shame. I once had a married man confess to me that he had had a homosexual affair with someone he met on the internet, and he spoke of how dirty and disgusting he felt afterwards, and how he just wanted to have a shower. What was he feeling? Shame. Homosexuals, bisexuals, transsexuals, zoosexuals, they all experience shame, deep, deep shame. It's also what heterosexuals experience when they have sex outside of marriage. And this is where the gospel of Jesus Christ is so relevant. Because notice how they all feel. Dirty, in want of a shower. Naked, in want of a covering. In a sentence, they want to be washed. They want to be covered. And that's exactly what Jesus offers. He offers us a cleansing and a covering. It's why Jesus came to die for us sinners, sinners of all sexuality stripes, sinners of warts and all sexualities. Jesus came to die so that we might be washed and redressed in new clothes. This passage in Genesis 2, 24 is picked up by Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 because uh, Paul's point is that human marriage is a picture of Christ's relationship to the church Uh, he refers to this passage. Listen to what he says in chapter 5, verse 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Do you see the language? Jesus died so as to wash his bride with water, which means that she was first dirty before he died for her. And then notice the language of dressing her in a robe without spot or wrinkle. It's a language connected to clothing, to a wedding dress. Paul speaks of the bride of Christ being cleansed and clothed. Paul says the same in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, speaking of a whole list of sins, one of which is homosexuality. Paul says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It's always struck me that Paul begins his list of what has happened to us with the word washed. You were washed. That's the wonderful good news of Christianity. Jesus' blood cleanses us, but it doesn't stop there. Once He cleanses us, He covers us with His righteousness, and then He begins to change us. Notice the tense in the verb. Such were some of you. No matter who you are, whatever you've done, with whoever you have done it, Jesus Christ is willing to wash you, to cover your shame. Why? Because He hung ashamed and naked on a cross for sinners of all sexuality types. And then he promises to change us, just like he did the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross had his sins washed away, and he also had his mouth washed out. 
justification and sanctification in that one moment of placing his faith in Christ. He was united to Christ, and as a result, he was washed. And he was united to Christ, and as a result, he started to speak differently. The answer to our fallen sexuality, no matter how we have expressed it, and we have all expressed our sexuality in a fallen way, some way. The answer to our fallen sexuality is to be united to the man who accepted, respected, and embraced his gender and sexuality perfectly, Jesus Christ. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That, brothers and sisters, is the great good news that people need to hear in this current day of gender and sexuality confusion. Jesus Christ is the Savior of sinners. So come and be washed. Come and be clothed. And come and be changed. Amen.